Okay, in, in my concluding remarks, I had sort of wrapped up uh, the discussion of uh, India uh, and the rebellion of 1857, 1858, uh, and the implications of the rebellion and the transformation um, in India, because India was no longer, uh, as you might recall, a uh, uh, ruled by the East India Company, but rather in 1858 it became a crown colony. All right. So uh, we will be we will be coming back to the subject of colonialism on a number of different occasions because it's a theme that runs as I pointed out to you on previous occasions uh, throughout the course, uh, particularly when we turn to Africa. But, but at this juncture, I want to just alert you uh, very briefly to that reading which I had actually pointed out to you before. This is the, this is the chapter, the two chapters from Jawaharlal Nehru's Glimpses of World History, uh, which have to do with the, the colonization of Ireland, because I want to remind you that when we're looking at colonialism, we're looking really at a spectrum. And that spectrum is that we have to think about uh, internal colonialism. Uh, and then we look at, uh, and internal colonialism here would mean, for example, the colonization of the Irish uh, and the Welsh and the Scots uh, by, by England. Uh, we can also think of the colonization of women uh, in every country nearly as a form of, as a form of colonialism because uh, what I've tried to establish for you is that colonialism also entails what we might describe as the colonization of the mind. Uh, and effectively, that's where I think we can begin to think of the colonization of the working class, colonization of women, and so on, as part of that spectrum. Uh, and then on the other hand, we have, uh, we have, for example, the case of Africa, where, where the project of colonialism, of course, began somewhat later, when we turn to Africa in much greater detail. Uh, but, I, but, I want, but I gave you a reading by Cecil Rhodes called Confession of Faith at this juncture rather than when we look at Africa in detail uh, because I wanted to suggest to you that, that there was a difference um, in the colonization of India as opposed to the colonization of Africa. Uh, and one fundamental difference is this, that Asia was looked at as a kind of realm that was effeminate. That is that you know, you think of, you think of this, the English phrase, men, women, and children. You've encountered it thousands of times. It's in the newspapers, you know, when, when you speak about a particular context and then you say men, women, and children. It's usually in that sequence. Um, and that sequence is, of course, a hierarchical sequence because that implies that men are at the top of the hierarchy, women are somewhere in the middle, and then you have, and then you have children. And it's that similar kind of hierarchy which you see in the phrase Europe, Asia, and Africa, which you will encounter once again, because Africa is sort of at, if I may put it this way, according to this scheme of things, in a primordial state, right? So Africans are like children. Uh, Asians are not so much like children. They're more like women. They're effeminate. And in fact, there were, there were European colonial writers, uh, English colonial writers in India, who argued that there wasn't a single man in India, because all men, in, in fact, were actually really effeminate, Asian men, right? So if you look at this particular, if you look at this particular document, uh, which is really an abominable document, but that's, he puts it very bluntly. What does he say? Rhodes, he says that, I contend that we are the finest race in the world, and the more of the world we inhabit, the better it is for the human race. Right? Just fancy those parts that are at present inhabited by the most despicable specimens of human beings. I mean, this is Rhodes writing. And you have to ask yourself, how come a person like him doesn't feel the slightest sense of shame in writing about another group of people in this particular fashion? Right? But he doesn't, because that was, in fact, the norm. And I have to remind you, for those of you who are aspiring, maybe there's one or two students in this class who is aspiring to get a Rhodes Fellowship when you graduate and then you go to Oxford. Well, the Rhodes Fellowship is named after this man, Cecil Rhodes, right? And you have to think about what are the implications of continuing that strand of thinking, which is effectively what's happening when we try to perpetuate the memory of a person like this person, right? Let me repeat the sentence. Just fancy those parts that are at present inhabited by the most despicable specimens of human beings. What an alteration there would be if they were brought under Anglo-Saxon influence. Right? 
And of course, you have to, you have to remember that, that, that Rhodes sets up a hierarchy even within Europe because what he's going to argue is that the English are a much finer specimen of human beings than the Germans or the Irish or the French. And of course, if he thinks that, that if he has a hierarchy within Europeans, within white Europeans, you can imagine what he thinks obviously about darker people. Right? And so this, this, this is again a way of also thinking about internal colonization because one should not be under the impression that it was only race that was the most imperative factor. Race was certainly an imperative factor, but I can tell you that there are many instances where the English treated the Irish just as badly as they treated the Indians. Uh, and partly that had to do with the fact that the Irish were predominantly Catholic. And as Nehru points out, I mean, it's really quite an astonishing fact and it's very much part of the modern period that we're looking at. In England, you could not be a member of parliament if you were a Catholic until 1829. It is only after 1829 that Catholics were allowed to occupy a space as a member of parliament in Britain. Right? So there are various forms of colonization and when we're looking at colonialism, what I want you to keep in mind is the idea of colonization in the broadest sense of the term. Right, now we're gonna to turn to Latin America, but before we do that, I want to have you think about what's really happening because otherwise we'll have this idea that, well, you know, there's a revolutions going on in Europe, there are revolutions going on in Haiti, there are revolutions going on in Latin America, you know, there's a rebellion going on in, in India, there's the American Civil War, it's just one war or rebellion after another. So one other way to think about it is that this is the period when the idea of the nation is really emerging and taking center stage in world history. Right? Because if you look at the revolutions in Latin America, and here you have a, a, a map, a very simple map, but very useful for our purposes, 1700, um, and you see that the whole portion in green here, this is of course Portuguese held, and this is what modern day Brazil, right? Because as you, as you know, Latin America is predominantly Spanish speaking except, except for Brazil, which is Portuguese speaking. And then you have here, you have the Spanish speaking parts, right? And this bottom portion here is Patagonia, which has a slightly more complicated history. And then if you look at this map over here, you begin to see how, uh, you know, now you fill it in with the, the political details and it gives you a little bit more detail about, so here again, you have the, the Portuguese part and then you have the Spanish part and it breaks it down into some of the major, major areas. And of course you can get, as we'll see in just a moment, we can get a lot more detailed maps. But what's really emerging here? What's really emerging if you here, look here, and if you look at this map, and again, you can study these in much greater detail when they're posted for you. So it all, at this point in time, what this map shows is that all the portion in the green are independent states now. They're all independent states. That is that in each of them, you have the emergence of a nation state. And what was the quest in India about? It, the rebellion that we looked at. So we can des describe it as an anti-colonial rebellion. Some historians described it as the first thrust towards nationalism, right? The first impulse of nationalism, the creation of a nation state in India. Of course, it didn't come about until 1947. And when it came about, came about in 1947, it wasn't one nation state, there were two because India was going to be partitioned and Pakistan would emerge as another nation state. So the, what I'm suggesting to you is that it's very easy to just look at all of this and say, well, you know, there are rebellions, revolutions going on, but the principal thrust there is the idea of the nation. So this obviously leads to the question, what is a nation? What is a nation and how is it different from a nation state, right? And I don't have the time for a Socratic exercise here where I would ask you what is a nation, then each one of you gives me a reply, and then we say, okay, well, maybe this is not sufficient. So let me tell you what, what really is a nation and what is a nation state, and what's the difference between the two. Think of it this way. There are a group of people who constitute a nation at this point, but are not a nation state. In fact, their greatest desire is to be constituted into a nation state. And I'll give you two examples. The two examples 
of a group of people who think of themselves as a nation and would like a nation state are the Palestinians and the Kurds, right? They're a group of people who feel they have something in common. And now you have an essay by Ernest Renan, and that essay is a classic essay dating back to about the 1880s where he poses a question, what is a nation? So he says that, look, some people argue that a nation is a group of people who share something in common. All right, fine. Now, what is that thing that is in common? So if you said language, now obviously we can falsify that argument. We can falsify that argument very easily by looking at the example of India. Because in India you have over 500 languages and you have 15 constitutional languages. Each of them has a minimum of 10 million speakers. Some of them have 400 million speakers. Some of them have 80 million speakers. Right? And you can even look at a less complicated example and that would be Switzerland. Because Switzerland, which is a nation state, right, has three languages. Those three languages are French, German, and to a lesser extent, Italian. Right? It has three languages. You can look at Canada, which seems to about the most homogenous place on the world, barring a few other countries, but even Canada actually has a substantial French-speaking province called Quebec. And you know that, they're, that in there, there's been a kind of a quasi-separatist movement in Quebec going back for decades because the French-speaking part of Canada feels that it's somewhat different than the English-speaking part. Of course, they can feel that. I mean, if you're sitting in India, they look ag absolutely identical to 99% of the people in the world, you know. Right? So those differences are, are relative. But you see the point that it's not language that is necessarily common to everyone who is now a Canadian or everyone who is a Swiss. So then if you said, well, maybe it's religion. Well, you know, India has 200 million Muslims. It has 800 million Hindus. It has 50 million Sikhs, 40 million Christians, so forth and so on. So, so it's really, religion is not common and India is still holding together. I mean, I've been hearing predictions since the day it acquired independence that it was going to fall apart. At nine, right? But it's still holding together. 1947, it's been 70 years. And then we can, we can say, well, maybe common history. Maybe that's what makes a people into a nation when they have a common history. So what's a common history between black Americans, American Indians, and Italian Americans? Right? We could ask, we could pose it that way so forth and so on. You see, so for every answer that you give, Renan says, we can find examples to the contrary. We do know that a nation is a group of people who somehow think they have something in common. And of course, one of the reasons why we have such things like the national anthem in almost every country of the world, a national bird, you know, there's a national bird in the US. There's a national flower. There's a national animal. Why is there all of this? Because these are all attempts to create a certain feeling of unity among a people. Right? And Renan's f ultimate answer is that, well, you know, look, there's something ineffable, something that we cannot quite quantify when we think about a, a nation. There's something like a common soul. But then that's almost a form of mystification. When you say that there's some kind of common spiritual principle, right? then we say, well, that's a form of mystification. And of course, we could also argue that some nations produce that effect of unity much more successfully than others. And when they do produce it successfully, they gravitate towards becoming a nation state. So, I mean, I think that one of the most extraordinary things about the U.S., when I look at this room and I see that, well, there are people probably from 20 different immigrant backgrounds, but what's extraordinary is how in the United States there are processes of homogenization and Americanization which take place so that effectively, by the second generation, most people who are, come from immigrant families can no longer either speak or read their, the native language they had grown up, and certainly by the third generation, it's completely disappeared. Almost completely disappeared. Right? So the United States has, has been extraordinarily successful in creating that kind of feeling of what you might call 
unity. Right? And now, if you think about the difference between a nation and a nation state, then let's be very clear what that difference is. A nation state is a nation backed up by a military and a navy. Right? When I say navy, of course, I'm including air force and all of that too, basically a military. It's a, a nation state is a nation backed up by a military force. And then, of course, it's backed up by such things as a regime of passports. Right? If you're a member of a nation state, you get, an issue, you get issued a passport of that nation state. And you know the Palestinians are not a nation state. And one reason you know that they're not a nation state is the Palestinians cannot issue a passport and have the faintest hope that the passport that they issue will be accepted in the 190 countries of the world. Right? Same thing holds true for Kurds. And of course, the reason why you have passports, which is a very, by the way, a very recent invention. No one was traveling with something called the passport in 1800 or even 1850, I can assure you. You know, if you read the social history of the passport, it's a relatively recent invention of our times. Right? And it is a way of regimenting people. It's a way of introducing a regime of surveillance. And that's what the whole ruckus that you're having right now about border control and all of that is partially about the question of what does it mean to be a nation state? And, and one of the things it means to be a nation state is that a nation state thinks it has a privilege of enforcing its borders. You know, right? And I'm suggesting to you that what's happening here in the late 18th century, moving into the 19th century, is this aspiration for people who thought of themselves as a nation to now constitute themselves into a nation state. And so when we, you look, look at the revolutions of Europe in 1848, that's what you're going to find. You're going to find that borders are going to change, new nation states are going to emerge. And of course, in Asia and Africa, this process continues well into the 20th century with decolonization. Right? So this is the largest scenario that you have to keep in mind. Now, let me very briefly look at the revolutions um, of in Latin America in 1848. Very, very briefly, because the intent here is not to consider that in great detail. I mean, just go back to these slides here. What we're saying is that, you know, if you look at 1700, you've got a significant portion, uh, which is uh, the, a, a big chunk, which is under Portuguese control, and then a larger portion, which is under Spanish control. Uh, and there's going to be, obviously, aspirations as we move along in time for freedom. Right? Now, when we're looking at Spanish-controlled uh, Spanish uh, 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 South America, uh, what you have to really consider is the following. You're talking about really four or five different population groups. Right? You're talking about, obviously, Europeans who have come from Europe, mainly from Spain, some from Portugal, the ones who go to Brazil. Right? Then you have Creoles. Creoles are... Europeans who are born in the Americas. They're born in the Americas. Yeah, so, they, so they're born either in, in, Spanish, in the Spanish part or in, in, the, in the Portuguese part. Then you have mestizos, and mestizos are people who are mixed, where one parent is white and one parent is indigenous. And then you have mulattoes, where one parent is white and the other parent is black. And of course, you have a black population of slaves. The country that imported the largest number of slaves in the Americas was Brazil. More so than the United States was Brazil. And in Brazil, slavery was not abolished until nearly the end of the 19th century. It was only in the 1880s that slavery was fully abolished. They, and of course, the, in, the remnants of that are still there as they are in the United States. Because if you look at the election of the, the recent election um, that took place in Brazil, and I hope that some of you keep up with the news because the person we are looking at who was just elected in Brazil could single-handedly contribute more to, cli to global warming than anyone else in, the, in this world. The reason for that is that he is... He is a person who has threatened to open up the entire Amazon. 
okay, to mining, logging, you know, you name it, drilling, right? And this person, again, represents what you might describe as the more white racist element in that society, Bolsonaro, right? So th this, th this, th this distinction of groups all goes back to the conditions under which European migration started into, into the Americas, and then obviously the import of slaves. And as I pointed out to you, Brazil had a very substantial portion of the slaves. Now, if you just think about the French Revolution for a moment, if we're looking at the wars of independence in Latin America, and these wars are being conducted mainly in the 18. <coughs> hundreds, early 1800s, shortly after the Haitian Revolution, all right, moving into the 1820s, by 1823, by 1823, most of these countries have become free. And that is exactly the time when the United States declared that this part of the world would now be free of European influence. If you remember your American history, you remember what that, what that doctrine is called, the Monroe Doctrine, right? A doctrine issued by, it was not called the Monroe Doctrine, it only came to be called that, but it, but it goes back to a pronouncement made by James Monroe, the President of the United States, in his State of the Union Address in December 1823, where he said that this part of the Western Hemisphere shall be free of European influence. And of course, you can say that what, what Monroe was doing was he was setting up the stage for American intervention, saying that the old world should not interfere. You can read it as a, as a declaration of independence, uh, as a de declaration of support by the US for these countries which had become free. But you can also read it as a declaration by Monroe saying that, well, you know, Europe has no business messing in this part of the world anymore. Okay, this is really our hemisphere. This is our backyard. And of course, we're going to find as we move along into the late 19th century, particularly the 20th century, that the US did in fact treat much of this as its own backyard. Now, go back to the Haitian Revolution, because if we're looking at these wars of independence, we have to obviously logically ask, what were the sources of influence? The French Revolution, for sure. But the French Revolution only to a limited degree because, because, the, because the radical phase of the French Revolution, the terror, and then obviously the anti-clerical part of it, right, was not at all something that appealed to the Creoles in the Americas. You know, the, the, the Creoles were basically people who were devout Catholics for the most part. And so this did not appeal to them. But nonetheless, the French Revolution and its declaration of freedom, equality, fraternity, and all of that was a source of influence, as was obviously the Haitian Revolution. But there was a third factor. And that third factor was that there was a considerable amount of turmoil and confusion in the Iberian Peninsula. That is back in Europe and the Mediterranean, in the Iberian Peninsula, where Spain and Portugal, there was considerable turmoil in that part of the world. Part of that turmoil was created by the fact that Napoleon invaded Spain in 1808. Now when he invaded Spain in 1808, essentially what that meant was that the Europeans, the Spanish elites who were back in the Americas, they took this as an opportunity to declare their independence from Spain. They said, well, you know, partly because Spain is, as, is now preoccupied by the conflict in Europe. And so many of these elites are saying, well, you know, we're thousands of miles away from Spain. We are in the Americas. We're basically going to take control of our own destiny. destiny. So these Creoles in, begin to enjoy a period of self-rule. However, in 1814, Napoleon is going to be repulsed in Spain, and the elites come back into power in Spain. And what do they do? The first thing they seek to do is they seek to exercise control over the Creoles back in the Americas. Right? So that's the context for these wars of independence because the minute the Spanish restore their own control in Spain, they basically send over a new bunch of officers, you know, the peninsulars they're called, to try to assert control over their colonies 
in the Americas, in South America in this case. All right, and this is, this is essentially the context and then eventually we're going to find that the Creoles are really going to break away. And so if you look at the revolutions in Latin America, which began around 1810 roughly, moving in, last uh, until about 1830, in the north you have, you have Simon Bolivar called the liberator. Um, and incidentally, uh, a number of, number of countries in South America basically describe themselves as Bolivar republics, you know, Venezuela being uh, an, uh, an instance of that. And in the south you have a man called Jose de San Martin, Right? And there are a number of, number of somewhat smaller figures. Bolivar is the one person that I think we should look at. There's a letter that has been assigned to you, uh, which is a letter that he wrote in 1815, where he's, where he's discussing the, the conditions of independence and all of that. And that's one reason why I think we should really look at Simon Bolivar, because he is the commanding figure in Latin American or South American public life from about 1810 until 1830. He comes from a wealthy Creole family. As, as he's an army officer in, in, in Venezuela, what is now Venezuela. Um, and uh, he becomes a significant um, military uh, figure uh, and basically is going to try to lead the Creoles to, as I've said, independence. Uh, Venezuela is going to declare its independence in 1813. But again, without getting into the details, there's a kind of a tug of war, which goes back and forth, you know, all right? Uh, this particular document, letter from Jamaica, is a red letter that he wrote from exile in September 1815, uh, where he vows to end Venezuela's political and economic servitude to Spain. Right? And he's going to get some help from Haiti. Remember that Haiti is a free black republic established. Remember that, right, in 1804. And he's going to help get some help from Britain. He gets some help from Britain, not because the British are necessarily enthused by all of these declarations of independence, but this is part of what you might describe as a, a, a European battle for supremacy, right? A, a battle that is taking place on various fronts. And so this is so this is and and this is something I want you to keep in mind because when we go into the late 19th century and move into the 20th century, one of the ways in which I'm going to suggest to you we have to understand World War One and World War Two is that this is again a battle for supremacy within Europe and by Europeans. All right, it's just on a much grander and larger and much more terrifying scale than anything that had been seen in the 18th century or the 19th century. But there is, but, but I'm suggesting to you that this European battle for supremacy is something, is something that influences Britain to, to assist people like Bolivar. It's not, out, it's not done out of this idea of principles of liberty for, you know, uh, uh, people living in the colonies, so forth and so on. All right, um, and you can you can sort of read the textbook account of what happens here because you're going to find that there are a number of countries that are going to declare the independence: uh, Ecuador, uh, Venezuela, uh, Venezuela, as I've already pointed out to you, Colombia, um, and they're going to create a federation in 1822. This federation is going to collapse in 1830, and then once again these will become much smaller units. The gist of the matter is very simply this, that these wars of independence, once again, from our point of view, bring to the fore this idea of what I'm describing as a nation. The aspiration for freedom. The question, if I may put it this way, is why does the aspiration for freedom always take the shape of a nation state, right? Is that the ultimate destiny of humankind? If you look at the Palestinians today, what do they want? They want a nation state. And of course, it's not for us to say they shouldn't have one. I mean, if we all are part of a nation state, then you think to yourself, well, that's the natural aspiration. But what I'm asking is, is it really the natural aspiration? Is that the only form of political community in which we can locate ourselves, the modern nation state? Because as I'm going to argue for you later on, I'm setting it up, 
for an argument that's going to come much later on, and we're leading up to it, the modern nation state could be a very oppressive entity. Right? It may be an exceedingly oppressive ent entity because what it seeks to do is to create a certain kind of homogenization among the population. Right? That's, I think, what we have to really bear in mind. All right? And one could similarly look at the history of Mexico at this juncture because you know that there's going to be what's called the Mexican-American War, which is 1846 to 1848. And that's eventually, you know, and the year before that, you have the annexation of Texas uh, by the United States in 1845. And, that, and that's what's going to lead to the war. And then in 1848, we're going to see that there's going to be a treaty that's going to be signed, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, I think it's called, 1848. And that's basically what's going to fix the borders between the US and Mexico. Right? But it's the same struggle there without getting into all the details. This is a portrait of Bolivar that we're looking at over there. OK. And this brings me to, so if we're looking at South Americas, this brings me to the American Civil War of 1861 to 65, on which I do want to spend a little bit of time. And I want to look at, very briefly, the two primary documents that you have, which are the first inaugural address of Abraham Lincoln, of course, the President of the United States, and the first in, the inaugural address of Jefferson Davis, who became um, the President of the Southern States, you know, when they seceded, right? Okay, but before we get into those documents, let's just see if there are some ways in which we can think about the American Civil War, which will also help us understand not only what's distinct about the Civil War, right? And what are some of the sticky questions that emerge from the Civil War? But also, what might be the relationship of this war to the subsequent course of history, not just in the Americas, but all over the world, right? The, and the first thing I want to bring to your attention is that, that this war was, in a way, a dress rehearsal for the much more brutal wars of the late 19th, early 20th century. Because it's really the first war in a semi-industrialized society which really has a kind of mechanized slaughter. I mean, you're talking about substantial number of people who are going to be killed in this war, right? And of course, you have, you have big artillery at this point in time. Um, even if you've seen that film, which has a lot of problems, but I'm sure all of you know about the film, even if you haven't seen it, because it's long after, of course, um, you know, it was produced. I'm talking about Gone with the Wind. Uh, but if you remember the opening scene of that film, uh, you know, it's the shelling of Atlanta, right? Because, because what was distinct about that was the concept of total war. I would say the American Civil War is when the concept of total war was born. And when I say the concept of total war, what I mean is the idea that there are no rules really any longer for war. Because we have to remember that warfare, even though it may be an integral part of human society right from the very beginning, Generally, wars have been guided by rules, by rules, right? There's always been an understanding that there are certain things that you don't do, okay? And I'm saying that these rules were more or less broken down. They were broken down not because it was the Americans taking, but because that's the nature of, that's the evolution of war by the middle part of the 19th century. Right? This concept of what we are calling total war. That nothing is, for, nothing, is, nothing is impermissible any longer. And so therefore we shouldn't be completely shocked and terrified when we think about what happened in the 20th century with World War I, the trench warfare, and then obviously moving into World War II with the Holocaust and all of that. Now, there are some sticky questions. Those sticky questions have to do it. We're not going to be able to resolve them here, but it's important to raise them. Right? That there is still, in some ways, groups of, there's still a bit of a divide about how one thinks about the war. Was a war largely about the abolition of slavery, or was it really about the preservation of the Union? Right? Those, are, those are usually the two 
if I may put it this way, the two most evident uh, points of view, all right? Um, and as I said, we're not going to attempt to resolve that. Uh, but what is, I think, important is that the war sees, the end of the war sees the emergence of the US as a powerful and highly centralized state with interventionist tendencies and, large, and a large bureaucracy, which, and this bureaucracy is going to continue to grow. Generally, the American century is seen by most historians all over the world as having begun at the end of World War II, right? When, you, when Britain is largely destroyed, Germany, of course, is defeated and humiliated, right? large parts of Europe lie in rubbles, and the US had emerged as by far the greatest power at that point in time, by far the greatest power. And that's the beginning of what is called the American century. But in some ways, I'm saying this is all prefigured at the end of the Civil War. It's prefigured at the end of the Civil War because there's really nothing to stop the United States from westward expansion. The whole idea of what is called manifest destiny, right, going all the way to the, to the west. Right? And the absorption, of course, Texas had already been absorbed. That was a Mexican-American War, 1846-48. But then obviously the absorption of the Northwest and California and all of that. And here you have now a country which is straddling two, two oceans 3,000 miles apart. Right? And I'm suggesting that this is all facilitated by the end of the Civil War right? and the abolition of slavery in the formal sense of the term. We have to keep in mind only in the formal sense of the term because there are new forms of slavery and servitude that are going to be introduced uh, uh, immediately thereafter. Right? And the other way to understand the significance of this is that two aspects of 18th century British-led world economy disappeared between 1858 and 1865. Now, one of, them, one of them was in India. This is where you can see the relation between the two British empires, right? You have, this is another way, by the way, of thinking about the whole period is the two British empires. You had one empire in, in the US, which Britain lost, and just as it lost its empire in the US, and the eastern seaboard colonies, which eventually become the United States, it acquired an empire obviously in India, right? But at the, by this period, this six, seven year period, 1858 to 1865, you basically see the end of the East India Company. So you see really the end of that empire in that sense. And of course, you see the end of the British founded slave plantations of the Southern American states, right? So this is one way to understand the significance of the end of the Civil War and what it really meant both for the US and what it might have meant for uh, the world at large. Now, if we look at these two documents, the first inaugural address of Lincoln and the first inaugural address of Jefferson Davis, this is really the question that I want to pose to you. As you all know, the colonists sought separation in 1776 from the mother country, right? From Britain. And that's what the Declaration of Independence, July 4th, is all about. It's, you know, that the argument is that, well, we have come to a, to a, state, a stage, a state in time when our interests are no longer served. The colonists are saying we are being oppressed by the mother country. We have this aspiration for freedom and we're going to break away. Right? It's, it's an argument about separation. Now the southern states sought to secede from the Union in 1861. So the fundamental question for you is, are the two very similar or are they very different? Because you could make the claim that what Jefferson Davis was really doing when he became the president of the southern states, of the confederacy as it's called, right? that he was making essentially the same argument that Jefferson and the framers of the Declaration of Independence were making in 1776 and in the years thereafter leading to right, the Constitution. To the, to the con articles, articles of Confederation, and then eventually what becomes the Constitution of the United States of America. 
So I think that we would have to really look at the difference between the two. Why is one separation? Because it seems to me that if you look at how American historians have thought about it and how Lincoln himself thought about it, the argument there seems to be that there is a fundamental difference between the two, between the separation sought in 1776 and the separation sought in 1861. Why is one separation sought in 1776 legitimate in the eyes of Lincoln, but why is the secession of the southern states illegitimate? Because recall, and I want to quote this from Lincoln's first inaugural address, right? because it makes it very clear that at least at this time in 1861, Lincoln was not opposed to slavery as such. And he had no intention of tampering with the institution of slavery in 1861. Uh, many people point to the Emancipation Proclamation. The Emancipation Proclamation is later. It's 1863, January 1863. Right? So what does Lincoln say? And I'm quoting from the first inaugural address. I have no purpose, directly or indirectly, to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. I believe I have no lawful right to do so. These are not words I'm making up. These are words drawn from his inaugural address. Right? He says, I have no business to interfere in the institution of slavery, and I have no lawful right to do so. And I have no inclination to do so. I mean, that's astonishing to me, that he didn't have to add that. He could have said, I have no right to do so, you know, but I would like to do so, but I'm prevented from doing it because I believe in the rule of law. I believe in the spirit of the Constitution. The Constitution doesn't permit. No, he says, I have actually no inclination to interfere in the institution of slavery at all. And of course, we could argue that, well, maybe Lincoln evolved. Maybe he didn't see slavery as an evil in 1861, and by 1863 he saw slavery as an evil. Well, I think that that would be a little charitable interpretation, frankly. You know, if he had some kind of epiphany in, those, in that year and a half that made him change his mind, no, right? So I think that we will need to arrive at a very different explanation for why Lincoln is thinking along these lines. And Lincoln furthermore declares that we denounce the law less invasion by armed forces of the soil of any state or territory, no matter what pretext, as among the gravest of crimes, right? And then, of course, there was this very complicated question of fugitive slaves. What do you do with fugitive slaves? Right? So if we, if we wanted to have a much more detailed discussion, we would really have to venture into that. So what might be the possible explanation for why Lincoln is and American historians have viewed the, the, the quest for separation in 1861 very differently than the quest for separation in 1776, okay? And before, before I venture to give you an explanation of that, let's just look very briefly at what Jefferson Davis says in his inaugural address when he becomes the president of the Confederacy. And I quote, our present condition achieved in a manner unprecedented in the history of nations illustrates the American idea that governments rest upon the consent of the governed. This could be Lincoln saying that, right? This could be the Declaration of Independence because what was the Declaration of Independence? That, that the idea of government rests upon the consent of the governed and we no longer give our consent. That's what the colonists said in 1776, right? And that it is a right of the people to alter or abolish governments whenever they become destructive of the ends for which they were established. So Jefferson, Jefferson Davis's claim is that the government was, whatever purpose it was established for, the government of the United States, that purpose is no longer being served for my people, the people of the South. And therefore, the people of the South have the right 
to alter or abolish this government. And therefore, he's saying that the southern states are going to secede. Now, what's really remarkable is, frankly, it's exactly the same argument, if you think about it, as the argument that you find in the Declaration of Independence. And if that is the case, then we have to say, why did Lincoln go to war? Right? Why did Lincoln go to war, if that's the case? Because it's certainly not because of the abolition of slavery. That has been established by Lincoln's own inaugural address of 1861, which I've quoted to you. And then we have this fundamental problem. Right? So is it true to state as I point out there, that Jefferson Davis, in contrast, sees the right of the southern states in 1861 in much the same way as he saw the rights of the colonists in 1776. And, this, and my explanation is this, that Lincoln sees the Union as an organic whole, as an organic whole. So he's really working with the metaphor of what is organic and what is inorganic in society. All right, and let me just let me just explain that a little bit more. When I say that he sees the idea of the union as an organic whole, he saw the southern states as mutineers. Okay, it's a mutiny. Now you know what a mutiny is. Mutiny is when you have an army and that within the army, some people say, well, we're not going to follow the rules any longer. Right? When you rebel within the institution of an army, right? so he fundamentally is seeing the southern states as a kind of group of people who are mutineers. That is that they are destroying what is organic. What is organic? In the case of 1776, Lincoln would have argued there was no organic bond anymore between the colonists and the mother country. Right? That it, it, it is that rift had to take place because they were no longer part of the same, if I may put it this way, organic whole. They were not part of the same moral universe. And what, what he is doing in the case of 1861, and what American historians who have interpreted the Civil War in this fashion, is what they're doing is precisely suggesting that, look, 1861 is different than 1776 because now you really have not a separation that is organically dictated as it was in 1776, that it was bound to happen because there were no links left anymore between the colonists and Great Britain. Right? Here he's saying the links are all there. They may be corrupted and contaminated by the institution of slavery, for example. Right? And so tacitly the argument is an argument for the abolition of slavery that once we remove this, this organic whole is restored. Right? That's, I'm suggesting to you, the real difference from Lincoln's standpoint between what happened in 1776 and 1861. Right? So you see, these two documents have to be read quite closely to be able to understand exactly what the difference is between the two. Well, we're going to end over here um, because time is up. And, and in, 